Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nirav Shah. I'm the director of the Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. I'm delighted to join everyone today to provide an update on COVID-19 here in Maine for today, August 6th, 2020. Right now, Maine CDC is reporting a total of 3,997 cases of COVID-19, a net increase of five cases since yesterday. Of those, 3,581 are confirmed cases, an increase of 13, and 416 are probable, a decrease of eight cases. A decrease of eight cases most usually results from individuals who are classified as probable cases, often because they are close contacts of confirmed cases and have symptoms of COVID-19. But those individuals may opt to get tested. And if they test negative, they are removed from the probable count, in this case resulting in a decrease of eight cases. Right now in Maine, 11 people are currently in the hospital with COVID-19, three of whom are in the ICU and one of whom is on a ventilator. That brings our total hospitalization rate right now in Maine to fewer than one person per 100,000 people in the hospital. To put that number in context, the national hospitalization rate across the United States right now is 17 per 100,000. The rate in Maine is just under one per 100,000. 124 individuals have passed away with COVID-19. And as of today, 3,475 have recovered, an increase of 19 individuals since yesterday. Among our cases, 907 are healthcare workers. I'd like to take a moment to provide updates on some of the outbreaks that Maine CDC is, a, is, is involved with right now. I'm pleased to report that one outbreak has closed at the mooring on Foreside in Cumberland County, where there had been a total of six cases. We're also reporting a new outbreak today at the, at the Pine Point Center in Scarborough, where thus far two residents and two staff members have tested positive. This testing is as a result of proactive surveillance in an effort to look for cases as they start to arise. The facility is conducting additional rounds of testing and further results will be available over the next few days. I'd like to next provi to provide an update of some of the outbreaks at farms across Maine. At Hancock Foods, there are a total of 11 cases associated with that entity. At Merrill Farms, there are a total of nine cases. And at the Wyman's Farm, there are a total of four cases. And always, as always, I'd like to thank the growers as well as our close partners at Maine Mobile Health. The reason we are aware of these situations is because of the partnership among the growing the growers, Maine Mobile Health and Maine CDC to provide widespread easy access to universal COVID-19 as agricultural workers are showing up. They are offered testing as well as an array of other preventive health services by Maine Mobile Health, not just COVID-19 services, but other healthcare services. And as a result of that proactive approach, we are aware of these situations and can intervene quickly and efficiently. And finally, an update on an outbreak situation in Lewiston. At Central Maine Medical Center, there are now a total of 15 cases. Closely linked with that outbreak is the outbreak at, Marsh, at the Marshwood Center, where there are now a total of 25 cases, 16 among residents and nine among staff. In terms of our metrics around testing, our positivity rate for cases reported, for test results reported yesterday is 0.78%. That is based on 2,685 PCR tests that were reported to Maine CDC yesterday. And again, that one day point positivity rate was 0.78%. Of course, the number that we really look at 
is not the one day rate, but the seven day rate. And that seven day weighted average for PCR tests reported to Maine CDC right now stands at 0.94%. To put that number in perspective, the national US wide positivity rate right now is 8%. And again, by contrast, the rate in Maine right now is 0.94%. Testing volume as well stands at 171 tests for every 100,000 people. As swab and send sites are continuing to come online, we anticipate that that number will increase. Before we turn to questions, I'd like to take a second to take stock of where things stand in Maine right now and provide some additional context around the numbers that I mentioned by way of providing an update on where things stand with some of our states, our neighboring states up here in the Northeast. Let me first start by noting the fact that today marks the second day this week where we have had a net total of five additional cases each day. That is an encouraging sign. More than anything, it is a testament to the fact that Maine people have taken to heart the scientific recommendations to wear face coverings and stay physically distanced from one another. Wearing a face covering and physically distancing yourself from another person require fundamental shifts in the way that we live our lives. It's one thing to avoid a social gathering when it's the dead of winter, but in the summer, staying physically apart and wearing a face covering is not easy, nor is it fun. Let me be the first to acknowledge that. To me, it's like being on a diet. It's no fun. It's not enjoyable. Nobody wants to have to do it. Nobody likes having their doctor tell them that they need to do it. But as your doctor will tell you, when going on a diet is necessary, doing so will help you stay healthy and avoid other diseases. But let's face it, diets are crummy. They require us to change our own behaviors, which is perhaps the hardest thing out there to change. Just as with diets, when your doctor tells you that a diet is needed, in the same way with face coverings, the outcome is worth the effort. That's what we've been doing here in Maine. We've been on a very long COVID-19 diet. And the reason that we look good now is because of the diet that we have been sticking to, not despite it. As much as we may all want to, now is not the time to abandon that diet and indulge in a barbecue or a pizza party. To do so right now would be a definite risk. We have come way too far as a state to throw out all of these months of dieting, to throw out all of these months of progress. My request for everyone today is to keep it up. In fact, we have to double down on the COVID-19 diet that we've been on and keep wearing those face coverings and keep remaining physically distanced. We know how hard that is. It's not pleasant, it's not fun, but doing so is the reason that we have got to where we are as a state. I say this today because I'd like to take a moment to also discuss what is unfolding with respect to COVID-19 in other states across the Northeast right now. Let's take a look at Massachusetts. Two weeks ago, the number of cases that Massachusetts, Massachusetts was reporting on a seven day average was 295 cases per day on a seven day rolling average. That was two weeks ago. Yesterday, their seven day average per day was not 295, but 423. That's a 43% increase in the average number of cases each day, just in two weeks. In Rhode Island, 
The average number of cases each day two weeks ago was 62. Yesterday, it was 97. A 56% increase in the number of daily cases just over a two week period. In New Jersey, two weeks ago, they were reporting an average of 227 cases per day. Yesterday, that average had risen to 386 cases, a 70% increase in just two weeks. As I've talked about for weeks, there are still large fires of COVID-19 burning across the country. And more recently, some of them are moving closer and closer to Maine. That is why now more than ever, we have an opportunity to keep COVID-19 at bay. And what the scientific data tell us is that the two most effective ways to do that, that are within everyone's reach, are wearing a face covering and making sure you maintain as much physical distance between one person and another to help make that happen. Just like a diet, we know that do doing so is not fun, but it's also one of the safest ways to stay healthy right now. So with that, I'd like to turn things over to our colleagues in the media. And today's first question goes to Liz Graves at the, at, at the Mount Desert Islander. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Good afternoon. Two questions today. The first is a follow-up from our conversation Tuesday about um, contract tracing partnership with MDI Hospital. I think the, the way I've, we've been understanding it for um, the, the whole pandemic so far with out-of-state cases is that if a Maine resident were physically in another state, tested positive while they were there, that case would be reported in Maine's count and also the case investigation would be transferred to Maine and vice versa. If a non-resident is physically here, it's reported in their home state. And I believe the case investigation is usually the responsibility of the home state. However, on Tuesday, when uh, we got a, a fuller statement about the partnership with MDI Hospital from C the CDC and the hospital jointly, it said CDC conducts case investigations for all confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Maine, this includes Maine residents as well as non-residents whose results are reported to Maine CDC by other states. So I was wondering if you could help clarify. Does that difference make sense? Uh, I, I think so, Liz, but I'll, I'll walk through it okay. top to bottom just to make sure. So uh, for case investigations, and, and I, let, let me start here. The, the process of investigating cases of COVID-19 entails two separate but very closely intertwined processes. One is case investigation, and then the other is contact tracing. Those two processes are designed to answer two questions. Question number one, where did someone get COVID-19 from? Question number two, who might they have given it to? One is called upstream, uh, upstream investigation, the other is downstream. Upstream investigation is what we refer to as case investigation. And for that process, Maine CDC conducts outbreak investigations on any Maine resident who is tested positive for COVID-19. They may be located in Maine, they may be located in Tennessee, they may be located in Alaska. As the cases are reported to us, we conduct the case investigation on them. Contact trace, and if, if, if an individual is an out-of-state resident, happens to be in Maine and is associated with an outbreak, we conduct the contact tracing there as well. I'm sorry, the case investigation. Contact tracing follows a similar pattern. What we are doing in partnership with MDI Hospital and what, for which we had a very productive discussion with them yesterday is that the contact tracing element of that for individuals on a pilot basis who are out of state residents, but who happen to alert MDI Hospital of their positive status, MDI Hospital will help us do the contact tracing piece. So we can, we can check in with others that they may have been in contact with to see if those folks have symptoms because they may still be in Maine. And if so, get those folks access to testing. Okay, awesome. Two follow-ups on that. One is, uh, you said if a, a non-resident is associated with an outbreak, and in my head so far, the outbreaks are defined 
uh, clusters and don't account for all of our reported cases. So if it's a single case in a non-resident, and Maine CDC would still conduct the case investigation? If, a, if there is a single case in a non-resident, the residents, the, re, the, the, the home state conducts the case investigation. And that's because Maine CDC, A, may not know that that individual is in the state. Case investigations do not entail GPS tracking. Right. So an individual may test positive in Philadelphia and come to Maine. And there's not a GPS system that sends up an alert to let us know that the person is in Maine. The, 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 the state of Pennsylvania in that situation would conduct the, the, the case investigation. It's also because individuals may be here for a day or two and then return to their home state. So generally speaking, what all states do, not just with COVID, but for all infectious diseases, is let the home state handle the case investigation because the home state is in the best position to conduct that investigation. Generally speaking, individuals are closest to home and we find that that has been the best way to do the investigations. Great, thank you. So if a, tra mm -hmm. if a traveler is getting tested in anticipation of coming here as our rule requires, there's no automatic way the result of that gets, gets flagged as a, this is a purse, this is a travel case and here's where they're traveling to. It's up to the, it's up to the individual to report their positive in the case of these, as these people in MDI have. Right. So if you go, if you go to your doctor, if a person in Kansas visits their doctor the week before they come to Maine, the laboratory testing system has no way of knowing that that person is intending to travel. And again, there's no GPS trackers attached to identifiers or anything like that. So there's not a system where someone sends an alert, their phone sends an alert to Maine CDC the minute they cross the border. We're not involved in GPS tracking or anything like that. So no, and, and usually never, in fact, do, is the, does the system say, okay, if you're gonna be traveling, then we need to know that before we'll test you so we can alert all the states that you're going to be traveling through. Uh, I'm not aware of any system in, in the country that, that is involved at that level of GPS tracking. I think to do so would raise really significant privacy concerns. Yeah. Okay, one unrelated question, if I may, and then I'll step down. Uh, I, I was glad you mentioned hospitalizations today. That was my other question. Do you have any sense of why hospitalizations have remained low? We, have it, we had a, a spike in early April and then in May. And even though we've had some days with more cases, we have not had um, spikes. So what are your thoughts about what we're doing right? Hospitalizations, for the most part, are a lagging indicator of overall case trends. So generally speaking, usually around 10 days after somebody has tested positive for COVID-19, if they require hospitalization, that is around the time, I'm sorry, 10 days after someone has developed symptoms of COVID-19. It's around 10 days or so that they may need hospitalization, 8 to 10. So the lower the number of overall cases, particularly the number of new cases, the less likely that there is to be hospitalizations. I think one reason that hospitalization rates in Maine are generally low is that our overall case numbers are low. So the two rise and fall. The other thing that I think is going on here is that we're seeing that individuals in Maine who are particularly vulnerable, that is to say the elderly as well as those with chronic conditions, have been extra, extra careful to avoid large gatherings, to avoid the possibility of being infected, to avoid situations where they could come in the way of COVID-19. I think that's, a, again, a testament to the fact that the elderly and those who have vulnerabilities that might make them medically susceptible to COVID-19 have really taken the scientific guidance seriously. What we've seen in other states, Florida, Texas, California, is that as there's been a spike in cases, there's been a subsequent spike in hospitalizations, most typically among the elderly. We have not seen that here yet. It could happen, as the experience in other states has shown, but it's a testament to the fact that vulnerable folks have taken this seriously and made sure they avoid being in the path of the virus. Awesome. 
Thank you. Uh, Patrick, I'm going to turn to you next. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Shaw, and I just couldn't agree more about diets. Yeah, um, they're terrible. So, worst. Uh, two, uh, two, two things, two largely unrelated things. Um, if we're looking at these increasing rates of um, in increasing daily rates of the virus in states like uh, like Rhode Island and Massachusetts, I can only assume it's going to be longer before they have easier easier access into the state. But with states like New Jersey that have um, that that benefit from the sort of black restrictions, is it possible it could be taken away and they'll sort of be back on the negative test or quarantine regimen that the other states are on if they continue in this sort of unfortunate direction? And also, um, the, the, the state is dealing with a looming budget crisis about uh, uh, because of the pandemic, which was really unavoidable. All 50 states are going through it. I, I would just love to know um, how, if you have any thoughts about how the state can sort of navigate that and keep its public health systems in a, intact, because the state's going to need to save money, and responding to, to the pandemic is going to cost money. Sure. Uh, so, Patrick, the answer to your first question is yes. Uh, which is to say uh, being exempted from the 14-day quarantine or the not needing a negative test is not a one-way ratchet. It can be ratcheted backwards. We are continuing to look at all the data for not just the five states that have received that exemption, but of course other states as well, because that's a predictor of what might be coming our way. See, for example, Massachusetts and Rhode Island. But as to the other state, that you know, all the states that are currently exempted, we keep very close eyes on them, and uh, it is not a one-way ratchet. What what has what 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 goes on the exempt list can come off the list. As to the latter question, something we've been thinking about uh, quite extensively. Right now, we're still in the evaluation phase for what those situations budgetarily might look like. We haven't made any final decisions. Certainly, the governor's office and the the, the finance uh, folks, as well as the budget director. We'll have to certainly weigh in on that. I think we're right now, from Maine CDC's perspective, just in the earliest phases of evaluating that. What I will say is this underscores the need for federal assistance as well. Um, states are, are in a, all states are in a difficult position right now, and assistance from the federal government, at least as to the public health side, which is all I can speak of, at least as to the public health aspects of sustaining the COVID response, federal assistance will continue to be necessary throughout that. Going to turn now to Brooke Riley at ABC7. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, two questions. How many migrant workers are currently being quarantined in Bangor? It, that number is in very much in flux. It changes hour to hour as folks come in and then as they are deemed to be recovered or no longer at risk. Uh, it changes very, very frequently, Brooke. Uh, we'll get you the exact number as it stands right now, but please know that that number really does change uh, hour by hour, day by day. But we'll get you the exact number. Okay, great, thank you. And are you testing every migrant worker that comes into Maine or how is that working? Uh, we, Maine CDC, are working with our colleagues at Maine Mobile Health, as well as the community of growers that hosts the, the, the incoming agricultural workers to offer testing to as many of the migrant agricultural workers as possible. I, I can't tell you with 100% certainty that each and every one of them is absolutely tested. I, I, I don't know that that representation or claim uh, could ever be made, but we do work very closely with the growing community because they of course have an interest in doing the right thing here, which is to say making sure that individuals who are coming into Maine for whatever purpose, in this case, to help grow the food, help pick and pack and ship the food that we eat are healthy and are able to do that. Okay, great. Thank you. And yeah, if you could send me that number, that would be perfect. Sure thing. Thanks. Uh, Going to turn now to Joel Lawler at the Press Herald. Uh, yes. Hi. I have a, a couple of questions. Um, one is on the, uh, the swab and send sites. Are those... Um, have those been delayed in any way or are they on track? Um, and uh, I was noticing there's been somewhat of a plateau in 
the uh, the number of um, tests done per 100,000. Is, is that because it's taking longer for the, the national labs to, to come back? And then I, and then I, I do have a follow-up. Okay, uh, so as to the swab and sends, Joe, um, they are coming online. A number came online this past weekend. They're, we're working with another healthcare entity to bring on another batch of them online uh, in some areas of the state that we want to expand testing into. Uh, they haven't been delayed. They've been, uh, well, you know, they, they've been on track. Setting something up of this nature is a significant logistics challenge to make sure that, that there are swabs available, that transportation of the samples is done in an efficient manner, so on and so forth. So I think the project is overall on track. Um, we are, again, working right now to bring on some additional ones in areas of high need. Um, you, you asked that your second question is very interesting. I myself have been trying to talk to team members uh, to get a better sense of what's going on. Um, you know, the, the bottom line answer, Joe, is that I'm not sure. Um, as you correctly noted, that number is not just what Maine CDC's laboratory processes, but all the tests in Maine that are processed, some of which, a large fraction of which are done by Quest and LabCorp, as well as hospitals in the state of Maine. I, you know, Joe, I, I, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you I've got great answers or ideas. I'm not sure why there has been that plateau. Some of it is that the overall uh, rates of disease has been have been low, suggesting that individuals are not symptomatic and thus not clamoring for testing. That could be one possibility. Could it be that the the slower turnaround times at the national lab? Are contributing that is a possibility as well. Um, it, it's also, you know, a, a function of the fact that, again, because our overall rates of, of disease are low, there may not be as much demand. So I think it's a mixture. I don't have one single thing I can point to. Okay, my uh, my follow up is um, with schools now starting to release their reopening plans, and you know, main DOE giving the green designation to all sixteen counties. Uh, I'm wondering if you have a, a recommendation on contact sports, such as football, maybe soccer. Um, other states are moving them to the spring. Um, you know, with the hybrid plans, you know, not too many kids physically in school. And then after school, there's going to be 50 to 80 kids hitting each other at football practice. I, I'm, I'm just wondering if, if that's really realistic. Is that something we should expect? Yeah, Joe, um, it, uh, we, again, we've been really involved in discussions with the Maine Principals Association and the other bodies that oversee and regulate after school sports at the, at the high school, middle school, elementary school level. Um, ultimately, they are, the, they are the deciders on that issue, but our teams at Maine CDC have been really involved with them. Uh, you're correct to note the risks involved with such activities as a compared to other sports, tennis and others that are more by design, more naturally distanced. I don't think any final decision has been made on those, um, but to be sure there are those risks out there. The reason, the reason I, th I think there's still discussion around it is that, um, you know, given the, ult the overall low levels of COVID-19, there is that question about whether because of those levels, Maine might be able to undertake those sports in a manner that is safe in a way that other states in the South and in the West might not be able to do. Uh, because of course we have to recognize there's a benefit from school sports as well. No decision has been made whatsoever, but I think that's really the, where the discussion is at right now. But make no mistake, contact sports of that nature do bring risks with them. I'm going to turn next to Allison Ross at WMTW. Hi, Dr. Shaw. Thank you for taking my question. So just one question here. We're hearing of people, Mainers, going down to Massachusetts to receive medical treatment, then coming back here to Maine, and doctors are refusing to treat them and to see them because they've been to Massachusetts. We're also hearing they're having trouble getting a COVID test because they haven't been exposed to anyone or because they don't have symptoms. Are these people exempt? Is there anything they can do if that 14-day quarantine just is not possible? Um, so, Allison, uh, there, there is no exemption for folks in this situation. We understand that medical treatment 
if someone is going to Boston or to any other state, to Pennsylvania, et cetera, we understand that that treatment is absolutely needed. Uh, but there's still the possibility that someone could be coming back into Maine and unbeknownst to them, potentially carrying COVID-19. And so for that reason, even if the purpose of the visit, in that case, to seek medical care, is one that we would all agree is essential, we still recommend that they either quarantine or get a COVID-19 test either before they leave or upon return. We recognize that there are it is a challenge to do so. Uh, we think the availability of the swab and send sites will help alleviate that. One of the goals of the swab and send site is exactly for folks that you described, individuals that are coming to Maine from areas of the country where there is a higher burden of COVID-19 to provide a ready, available way for them to get tested and get a result as quickly as possible. I'm gonna turn now to Jay Michigan at WGME. Uh, thank you, Doctor. Um, a question from our viewer about reusable grocery bags. I'm not sure that's something we've touched on in four or five months of these conversations. Uh, back at the beginning, most grocery stores stopped accepting reusable grocery bags um, for fear of having them contaminated in some way. And certainly we've been using a lot of paper and plastic since then. From what we know about the virus and how things have developed with hard surfaces and other surfaces, is that, from what you know about this, still something that would be needed and is necessary for safety, or is it just an unnecessary precaution, do you think? Well, you know, Jay, here, here's where things stand scientifically with respect to things like um, reusable plastic bags and shopping bags and things of that nature. There is a theoretical possibility that COVID-19 can live on surfaces. And depending on the surface, that may be for 24 hours, in some cases, longer. But the studies that have demonstrated that have been under perfect laboratory conditions. And in no place in the real world do perfect laboratory conditions actually exist. We, what we also know is that even in those studies that have demonstrated that the virus can persist on surfaces in those perfect laboratory conditions, we have no way of knowing whether it can persist in large enough numbers and be transmitted to other people in a manner that could cause infection. It's theoretically possible. There's no question about that. But practically speaking, I'm not aware of situations where outbreaks have been generated because somebody put their hand on a bag with COVID-19 on it and then put their hand in their eye or in their mouth and transmitted the virus and then got it and then generated an outbreak. It's theoretically possible, but I don't know that it's really been something that has been demonstrated and proven in the literature. So for that reason, Given the environmental and ecological impact of, of, of new plastic bags and the impact that that can have on the environment, I think there's good reason for folks when they start going back and when they're, when they're grocery shopping and going out for shopping to use their own reusable cloth or heavy duty plastic bags. And to the extent folks are worried about that, one of the safest things to do with those reusable plastic bags is just to wipe them down with a little bit of soap and detergent, and that should, in principle, get rid of all the COVID-19 on it. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn now to Patty White at Maine Public. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. I've got a back to school question for you. Um, we've been getting some questions from parents about what happens when kids are back in school and a student develops symptoms of COVID in terms of who's supposed to quarantine and who should get tested. Can you talk about what the CDC's recommendations are for that kind of scenario? Sure, so we have a protocol that we follow with outbreak situations in general, that we've made sure we uh, take into account the realities of school. In the event that a child in a school uh, situation develops symptoms of COVID-19. So there's three immediate questions. Number one, what, what to do with that child? Number two, what to do with contacts of that child? And then number three, what to do at the school level overall? Let's talk about the child first. A child who develops symptoms of COVID-19 should immediately be tested, not just for COVID-19, but for the other very, very likely causes of things like cough, fevers, and runny noses. That could be the common cold. It could be adenovirus. It could sadly be influenza virus. Flu season is on its way here. So step number one is to make sure the child 
isolated, removed from the school setting, and provided testing, usually in this case by the child's pediatrician or family doctor. Number two, at that, at that time, the school, the Department of Education liaison will touch base with the main CDC liaison for schools to make sure that the public health intervention steps are, are being taken. That involves, at the classroom level, determining who the child's close contacts were. In some cases, that may be an entire classroom. It may be even be wider than the classroom. Those children will have to be quarantined and made sure that if they develop symptoms, they're offered testing at the appropriate time. Then the third question is what to do at the school level. Who else at the school might need to be tested? Would the teacher need to be tested? Would other staff members who may have come into contact with the student need to be tested? That is where the case investigation part comes into play. If the child ends up testing positive, and it turns out that the child had a prolonged conference with the teacher or a guidance counselor, those individuals would need to be identified and offered testing as well, especially if they start developing symptoms. And in order to uh, keep that sort of circle of kids um, and staff who may need to quarantine small, are you recommending that schools try to establish kind of cohorts of, of kids as much as possible? Um, that's really fundamentally a decision for the school. What we do recommend is that schools make sure they've got a good sense of, for example, seating charts, so that if we need to get a sense of who the child was in contact with, that information can be more easily obtained. Now, look, we fully understand that in many classrooms, the seating chart is, it's like a pile of spaghetti. Kids are moving around. That's the nature of an in-classroom experience. But the flip side of that may be that the classroom as a whole may need to be put under symptom monitoring and enrolled in our symptom checking process so that if they develop symptoms, they can get testing as quickly as possible. Great, thanks. Yep, I'm gonna turn now to Bob Evans at News Center. Good afternoon. As you mentioned on Tuesday, the global rush is on to find a safe and effective vaccine against COVID-19. But it typically takes several years to find a vaccine and have it complete the three consecutive phases of the clinical research. Uh, some experts are concerned, and are you concerned at all that once completed, some people might not feel totally safe or comfortable with getting a new vaccine that will have sort of been rushed through the process? Bob, I, I like the way you frame the question because the, the answer is, is that yes, I am concerned that there may be a perception among a lot of folks that the vaccine process was rushed and thus the vaccine may not have the safety profile of the vaccines that we've used and have known for decades. That's a concern. My job is to make sure that A, that we at the main CDC are keeping up at the science with the science and communicating it. My goal is to try to communicate that science in such a fashion as to instill vaccine confidence as the data become available. The skepticism that's natural in a process of this nature is, is understandable. I see it and I get where it comes from. But at the same time, the individuals who are involved with vaccine production, it is in their interest to make sure that any COVID-19 vaccine that becomes available and is released is as safe as possible. A vaccine that's not safe could fundamentally undermine confidence in the vaccine, overall vaccine system for decades to come. So it's in everyone's interest to ensure that any vaccine meets the acceptable thresholds for safety. My job is to communicate that science in a way that I hope will ultimately instill the confidence in whatever vaccines may be released. It's too early to tell what those data will look like, but my pledge to you is that I will keep everyone updated as those data become released. Okay, uh, one quick follow-up question, playing off Patrick's question. You said the exempted states are not guaranteed a spot on the list. So what exactly would one of the exempted states have to do or what numbers might they have to hit to get kicked off the exempted list? Sure. Um, the principle that we have adopted with respect to exempted states is a pretty straightforward one. We look at the overall prevalence, that is to say the overall number of cases adjusted for population in any of those states 
as we're thinking about granting them an exemption. The principle that we use is a straightforward one. If the prevalence of COVID-19 in any of those states is higher than the prevalence in Maine, that means that a person coming from one of those states without a quarantine, without a negative test, has a higher likelihood of having COVID-19 than does a person in Maine. If the prevalence from a particular state is at the same level or lower than that in Maine, then the likelihood that a person coming in from another state without a negative test, the likelihood that they may be raising the risk to Maine people isn't there because the risk of those folks is lower than that of Maine. So that's the general principle that we use. Basically, is the other state as safe or safer than Maine? And if they are, then it's safe for those folks to come here. And if, they're more, if, they're, if there's more COVID-19 in those states, it's going to be difficult for them to get a spot on the list. As you can imagine, as the contours of the outbreak change and other states closer to Maine start experiencing upticks, we're going to look at those data and make our adjustments accordingly. Uh, I'm going to turn now to Charlie at the BDN. Yeah, hi, Dr. Shaw. Thank you. Just one question for me today. Um, I'm not the first person to point out or the first reporter to point out that um, New Brunswick across the border has had many fewer uh, cases of COVID-19 than Maine, even though the two areas share, you know, some geographic and demographic similarities. And I, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on um, what the difference is there. And I know one, you know, area that was a difference was that New Brunswick instituted some restrictions just a little bit sooner, not a whole lot sooner than Maine. But um, yeah, wondering what your thoughts are on that. Yeah. You know, Charlie, I've, I've um, in, in the same way that uh, to kind of consistent with Joe Lawler's question, been taking a hard look at the testing data. I've been taking a good look and a hard look at what's been going on uh, in, in our uh, to the to the Canadian provinces that that surround us, and what you see is actually kind of a a, a a panoply of results. We'll start with New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, where the rates have been lower. Um, what you see there is a positivity rate that is about equivalent to what we've got here. And what I think is going on, at least in part, I, I don't have any silver bullet complete answers, but I think in part what's going on is a much, much more stringent travel restrictions. It's just very difficult to cross provincial lines. And in fact, in some areas, even cities within have just put down what's uh, you know, essentially a, a cordon, cordon around the city. The other thing is um, a, a much lower population density. Population density is not the entire story, to be sure, but it is part of the story. And I think what you're seeing in some of those provinces, New Brunswick in particular, is a lower population density. Thus, less chance that two individuals would interact and spread the disease. But what you also see uh, across the border are high rates of COVID-19 in Quebec. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. Um, you know, um, so there, there's positive stories and positive lessons to be learned from New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, perhaps even PEI which put an even more strict lockdown in place. But then when you turn your attention to Quebec, you see what can happen in a dense urban environment uh, where testing was a bit of a challenge initially, et cetera. So I think what you see across the border is, is, a, is a panoply of results. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Gonna turn next to Amy Brown at WERU. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. Is uh, MDI Hospital the only hospital in the state that you're hearing from that have been hearing from people who get their positive test results from their home states after they've arrived here? Um, it's, the only, it's the only hospital that we've heard from directly. Indirectly, I'm aware that there may be a similar phenomenon uh, happening at York Hospital. Um, but right now, the hospital that we've been in the most contact with is MDI Hospital. Okay. And because there's such a a difference in the turnaround time getting results between the CDC lab here in the state versus the national labs. How does one determine where their test is going to be processed before they go to get a test? Is it only like the swab and send sites that are using the CDC labs or is there some other way that someone can find that out before they go for their test? 
The best thing to do is to ask the healthcare provider who's taking your swab where they think or where they know that, that your swab will be going. That's the best way to find out. Um, a, a number of healthcare providers across the state utilize the main CDC lab here in Augusta. It's not just the swab and send sites. So the best way to try to get a sense of where your swab might be going and more importantly, what the turnaround time might be would be to ask the healthcare provider who's taking the swab as you're going through the process. But all That's the swabs, and, and, sorry. And, and, Amy, one, one important note, although nationally we have, we've all heard the stories about turnaround time stretching into seven, eight, nine, ten days. Completely unacceptable. But I would be remiss here if I didn't also remark on the fact that we at the main CDC have also gotten emails from folks who said, you know, I went to this location on this street in Augusta, uh, perhaps a pharmacy, for example, and I went on on a Monday morning and 24 hours later, I got an email telling me to log in because my test results were ready. And we've, we've received a lot of those emails as well. And so uh, although we, I, there's no question that there have been unacceptable increases in the turnaround time, at least in some instances, there have also been folks that have been able to get their test results back quickly. I say that not because I want to try to justify what's going on. I say that because if you're working or you're, you're wanting to get a test at, say, a pharmacy that's offering it in Maine, don't be dissuaded by what you hear as the long turnaround time. Please go nonetheless, because you might be in that group that gets their result in 24 hours. Don't let the the stories about the seven, eight, nine day turnaround time dissuade you from going to get a test if you're not feeling well or if you need one, because you too may be in that short turnaround time group. Okay, are all the swab and send sites are using the CDC lab though? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Gonna turn next to Dustin at New England Cable News. Sorry, I have two Zooms going at the same time, so I'm trying to adjust to that. Um, two questions on two slightly related but mostly different things. Um, the first is how, and you've sort of touched on this, are overwhelmed national labs impacting tourists trying to get tests to come visit here? And let's say if somebody wants to get a test quickly, what's the best way to mitigate that risk of you know having to wait eight days? Is it by utilizing this expanding swab and send system that we're setting up? Mm -hmm. um, so, Dustin, on the first question as to tourism, um, we've, we've heard anecdotally that folks have had to change plans because they have not been able to get their results. So there's no question that the increased turnaround time in other parts of the country, including perhaps in Maine, has negatively impacted folks' ability to come here. Uh, that, that's, that's unfortunate and really, to be honest, speaks to the wholly inadequate national testing infrastructure that exists in other parts of the country. There's no question about that. That being said, we've also heard from a number of folks that have come here, quarantined successfully while they were waiting for their results, and then when they got their negative results, were able to resume their vacation as they had intended. That's another viable option. For folks that wish to do that, though, the essence of that approach is not interacting with anybody that you didn't travel here with. Um, and then Dustin asked to the second approach for folks that are looking for faster testing options, uh, here in Maine at least. One of the best ways to do that, or rather the best way to know, sort of similar to Amy's question, is to call the healthcare provider in advance. The healthcare providers on the ground have a day-to-day -day sense of how quickly test results are coming back because test results are reported not just electronically to Maine CDC, but simultaneously to the provider that ordered them. So the healthcare provider that you may be considering going to will know, yeah, we're getting our test results back in about 24 hours, or no, you know, lately it's been five or six days. So the best thing to do is to call ahead before you go in. In fact, most places across Maine, across the country, want you to call ahead anyways, so you don't, you don't increase the likelihood of infecting somebody. So while you're making that phone call to book your testing slot, ask them what the anticipated turnaround time that they've been seeing is. That'll help you plan your activities and know what you're getting into. So there's, and, there's, 
a slightly related yeah. thing is, yes. what is the latest on the CDC's review of the American Cruise Line's proposal to send ships to Maine in the fall? What do you know about the plan and where's the thinking on it right now? So we, we have worked extensively with American Cruise Lines over the past, I'd say about five weeks maybe, uh, when they first reached out to Cruise Maine, our, our state epidemiologist has been working very extensively to do a word for word, line by line review of all of their plans. And um, right now where we are in the process is that we have, we, we have asked them to make a number of changes to their approach, which they have made. But another essential element of our review is to make sure that the cruise line has established connections and contacts in the various ports of call that they intend to call upon so that if a passenger or passengers requires emergency transport, as well as hotel accommodations, as well as medical evaluation, that the cruise line has not just touched base with providers at all the points of call, but has actually received letters of acknowledgement and support from the local EMS, from a local hotel and local healthcare providers, where those folks are saying, yep, we are aware of ACL's plan, and if they need us, we are ready to provide X number of ambulances, Y number of hotel, bed, uh, hotel beds, and Z number of hospital appointments. So that's where we are in the process. We, and until all of those letters are in place, they don't get Maine CDC sign off. Thanks. Uh, I'm gonna turn, and for our last question, to Morgan from WABI. Hi, Dr. Shaw, thank you. Uh, our question today is about uh, how colleges, college campuses could have an effect on a county's color designation for school. So if, a, if there are a number of cases at a, for people who live in the dorms, students who live in the dorms on college campuses, say for instance, you made in Penobscot County, could that affect or will that affect the color designation for schools? Yep, so Morgan, the answer is that it might. Um, what, do, what goes into that analysis is to what extent the affected college students may potentially have interactions with parents who might give the virus to their kids, to school children themselves, or to teachers in the schools. So one of the factors that we use as we are thinking about color designations is a set of qualitative factors, such as the presence of outbreaks or the conditions on the ground that you just noted. So it's not, a, it's not entirely a mathematical formula where we plug things into a computer that spits out a green, a yellow, or a red. We also have to take into account these local contours, like the situation that you described. If we determine that there were a significant number of cases, say in college students in a particular part of Maine, and that those college students interacted or had roles in the community that could then translate into risk for the school system, that would affect our color analysis. If hypothetically we determine that those college students did not have any interactions, maybe the college was far away from all the other schools and our investigation revealed that the college students didn't have any interaction with parents or teachers that would affect the school children, then it might not. That's why these determinations are not purely mathematical or formulaic. We have to take into account these local considerations as we're making the color designations. It's partly a science, but it's also an art. And that art entails take into, taking into account these local factors. So Morgan, thanks for that question. And I'd like to, as always, thank all 12 of our media colleagues today for their good questions. Before we adjourn, just to recap, although things in Maine have been encouraging to date, the reason that they have been encouraging is because of that strict diet that all of us have been sticking to. Now, diets are not fun, as Patrick noted. They're not easy. No one likes being on them. But the reason that we look good right now is because of that diet that we've been on starting in March all through the summer. We can't let up right now. We've got an opportunity to keep our numbers low, given that we know that COVID-19 rates are rising in other states very close by us. There is still the risk that COVID-19 rates in Maine could spike, but we've got within our power the tools to keep those, to keep, keep those numbers 
as low as possible. So I ask everybody, as we've said for weeks now, please, as you're going out, wear that face covering and maintain as much physical distance between person to person as you can. We hope, to the, we hope that the spikes in COVID-19 that have started to occur in the other Northeastern states do not find their way here in Maine. So with that, everyone, I thank everyone for your time and tuning in today. As always, please be kind and take care of one another. I look forward to catching up with everyone next week. Have a good afternoon.